Greetings board game fans! I apologize that the Sentinels RPG only had two videos last month when I said it was going to be all about it, so I'll make another video in the beginning of May to make up for that. However, this month is going to be all about Spirit Island, so let's introduce that game, shall we? So why am I talking about Spirit Island this month? Well, Earth Day is on the 22nd, and I think Spirit Island makes a good environment game. So what do you do in Spirit Island? Well, each player plays a powerful island spirit in an uncharted island. You have lived semi-harmoniously with the island natives, called the Dahan. However, colonizers start discovering the island, and colonizers do as colonizers do, and start trying to take over. Your job is to work together with your other spirits to show the colonizers the door, encourage them to leave your island, and never come back. To facilitate this, you are given a choice of one to four spirits out of a whole bunch of ones that exist on the island. A lot like the heroes from Sentinels of the Multiverse, the spirits from Spirit Island all play very differently, through use of some rather clever design in my opinion. Let's look at the spirit boards. On one side, you have a description and a lore blurb for your spirit, a simple bar graph of how they behave in a minimalist way, and the start of game rules, where your presence is placed before you start the game. However, you will spend most of your time looking at this side of the board. Every spirit has these sections, but the details on them are all going to be different from spirit to spirit. At the top of the board are your growth options. These are your opportunities for your spirit to grow in power. Spread presence to gain more energy card plays and reach, draw power cards to do more things, or reclaim cards to get all your spent cards back into your hand. When you select a section in your growth phase, you get every benefit listed in that box, so usually you will get multiple benefits from your growth options. Right below that, we see our presence tracks. Before the game begins, you cover every circle in this section with your presence tokens, except the two circles on the far left. Top track is usually your energy income, and bottom track is usually your card plays. I say usually because there are spirits that get additional benefits from the tracks, usually free elements or a small reclaim per turn. You get the energy and card plays from the furthest right uncovered circle in both tracks. And below the tracks, you get your spirits' innate powers. Unlike power cards, which require you to spend energy to play, these abilities are activated when you have enough of certain elements. Elements are gained primarily from your power cards. When you play power cards, you gain one of all the elements colored in the far left of the power card. Elements can also be used to get more powerful effects from some power cards. And to the left of the spirit board, right below your spirit's portrait, are your spirit's special rules. These are unique to every spirit. They could be benefits, drawbacks, or both. Always keep these rules in mind when playing your spirits to get the most out of them. So let's look at the game. You and your friends will get one to four spirits and one board of land per spirit. The spirit boards will tell you where to place your starting presence. You put the necessary tokens and minis on the spots indicated. Then the invaders get their first explore card and get moving. You get a lovely little reminder card to tell you what the turn order is, but essentially you get to grow in power, play cards, use fast cards, some random things can happen depending on blight card, fear cards, or events. Then the invaders have their turn, then the slow powers activate. Then you clean up your spent cards and go back to the growth phase. In the growth phase, you choose one, or sometimes more than one, of the sections available to you. You get all the benefits in one section. This symbol means you reclaim your cards, allowing you to get every power card in your discard pile and put them back into your hand. This is one of the more vital functions of any spirit. This symbol allows you to draw a power card. When you draw a power, you can either draw from the Minor Powers deck or the Major Powers deck. Minor Powers are less expensive to play, costing zero or one energy each, but also are generally less powerful. Major Powers can be very powerful, but can be much more expensive energy-wise, costing anywhere from two to nine energy to play. From my experience, they average out at about four or five, though I don't have all the content, so I can't be sure. Also, in order to gain major powers, you have to forget a power that you already have. You can forget one of your original cards, thus removing them from the game, or you can forget a minor or major power, placing them in their respective discard. When you go to gain a power, you draw four cards from the deck that you choose. You take a look at them, decide which is the most useful to you, put that card into your hand, and put the rest into the deck's discard pile. So power cards give you your choice out of four cards. This is enough to maintain the randomness aspect, but you still get your strategic element. If you gained a major power, then select any power either in your hand or in your discard to remove. This symbol represents placing presence. The arrow and number are a range indicator. If you see the arrow and a 1, you place the presence one space away from where you already have presence. If it's a 2 or 3, then it is up to 2 or 3 spaces away from lands with your presence. 
If it's a zero, then you have to place that token in a land where you already have presence. You may ask why do this? After all, it makes sense for your spirit to spread out their presence, since power cards run on the same range principle as placing presence. But some powers require you to have a sacred site, aka having two or more presence in one land. So you may need to consolidate your presence in order to use these. Any other growth benefits you get will usually be briefly explained on the spirit board. Once you've done your growth, you get to play your powers. Look at your presence tracks, gain the amount of energy that you have there, and add it to your stockpile. You get to play as many cards as the rightmost indicator shows. In this case, I get to gain 3 energy, and then play up to 2 cards. You don't have to play the full amount though. However, you do need to spend your energy up front. No waiting until you use the cards, pay in advance. Once you and all your other players have grown and played your cards, then you can activate fast powers. Fast powers will have the red bird symbol. These are useful for acting before the invaders do things. As a group, you activate your fast powers in any order. Lightning Strike Swift, which I affectionately refer to as the Murder Bird, can activate one fast power, let Vital Strength of the Earth use one, then Murder Bird can use two more, and then the ocean activates all of its cards, yada yada yada. You choose the order that best accomplishes what you're trying to do. Order can matter a lot in this game, so think about it. Once you and the other players have activated your fast powers, and again you don't have to use all of them, you might decide you only need the elements, then you go to the events that you can't control. This is the invader phase, where everything is things that they do. You start with blighted island effects. And since it is now relevant, let's talk about blight. Blight is a nasty effect that damages the land itself. When a blight is added to a land, it destroys one presence from every spirit occupying that land. If a Blight token is added to a land that already has Blight, then an additional Blight token is added to the land next to it. And if that land has a Blight, then it cascades again, onward until the Blight finds a land without one. Blight is one of the methods that you can lose, either by destroying too much of a spirit's presence, or emptying out the Blight pool. Now this isn't to say that Blight is inherently evil or even unnatural, it's just something that happens to the land. Indeed, the spirits themselves can add Blight, and a few even rely on Blight. It's just something to be cautious of. You generally want to prevent Blight from being placed, but sometimes it is necessary. Now back to the invader phase, there is one more thing Blight can do. If you choose to have a Blight card, then it gives you a buffer zone called Healthy Island. However, if you empty out the Blight pool on Healthy Island, then the card flips over, more Blight is added to it, and you get a Blighted Island effect. Now, Blighted Island effects are nasty in the core game, but they're a lot more tame in the later expansions. Some of them have effects that happen all at once. Others have continuous effects that happen right after the fast powers have been used. Once the Blighted Island effect happens, if it happens at all, we then flip over our fear cards. And now we have to pause again to talk about fear. Now, despite the negative connotation that fear has, it's actually a positive effect for you and your spirits. When you collect enough fear, based on the amount of spirits in play, you earn fear cards. Fear cards are single use and activate after the Blighted Island effect, if there is one. If not, then after the fast powers are done. The effects from fear cards are generally not amazing, but useful. But since they are fully random, you can't always plan for them. Where fear becomes very important, however, is unlocking terror levels. The terror levels are effectively your win conditions. You start at terror level 1, where the invaders have arrived and are at the height of their confidence. And therefore, in order to get rid of them, you need to eliminate every last one of the dirty SOBs. At terror level 2, you have them spooked, but they feel safe in their shelters. So you will have to destroy all towns and cities to convince them to leave. At terror level 3, you are frightening them, and the only thing keeping them together is their leadership in the cities. So you only need to blow those up. And finally, for the true pacifists out there, Terror level 4 finally convinces the invaders that the island is cursed or haunted, and they all leave, granting you an automatic fear victory. So you gather fear to get short-term bonuses, but in the long term, it makes the game easier to win. So once you've played all the fear cards you have unlocked, the invaders get to do their thing. They act in three steps. First, they ravage. The land card under Ravage have the invaders damage to Han and the land in those areas. Again, you can choose the order of the Ravages, because sometimes the order matters. When a land is Ravaged, invaders deal damage based on what is there. Each explorer has 1 health and deals 1 damage. Each town has 2 health and deals 2 damage. Likewise, each city has 3 health and deals 3 damage. All the little Tahan pegs have 2 health and deal 2 damage. 
When a ravage happens, invaders attack first. They deal all their damage at once. Dahan can't split the damage, so some may fall and others may not, depending. Invaders also deal the same amount of damage to the land itself, and if two or more damage is dealt, a blight is added to that land. And also do note, as this is a mistake that I have made before, Dahan do not act as shields for the land. The invaders attack the land and the Dahan separately, but simultaneously. Once the invaders attack, the Dahan retaliate, attacking the invaders back, and you can decide how the damage is distributed to take the best advantage of your powers. After the Ravage is the build. In each of the indicated lands, if there are any invaders present, they build. If there are more towns than cities, a city is built. If not, a town is built. Also, cities don't replace towns. They are made in addition to the towns already there. Likewise with towns and explorers. Towns don't replace explorers, they are made in addition to them. So leaving a land alone can have a very nasty ramp up effect. After the invaders are done building, they reveal the top card of the invader deck, and that land is where they are exploring. An explorer is placed in every land of that type on the coast, or adjacent to a land with a town or city. And you may see some exponential effects here, as explorers create towns, towns create cities, and towns and cities both create explorers. Also, if the card you revealed has a flag symbol, you activate your adversary's special power. We'll get into adversaries later. Once the explorer is done, the card in the ravaged space is removed and the other invader cards move a space to the left. The land that built will ravage the next round, and the land that explored will then build. This means there will always be some predictability when it comes to the invader actions, so you can plan ahead for these things. Once the invaders are done, your spirits may now activate their slow powers, the ones with the turtle symbol. These work the same as fast powers, but just after the invaders act. As a result, I find they are generally more powerful to make up for the slightly unpredictable board state. And once you have used up your slow powers, you clean up all the power cards you have used and place them in their spirits' discards to be reclaimed later. Any unit that has been damaged but not fully destroyed is fully healed before the next round. Then you go back to the growth phase. Keep going until either you or the colonizers take control of the island. Now to recap the turn order since I took a few detours, grow in power, play cards, activate fast powers, blighted island effect if there is one, Fear cards, if you have earned any. Invaders ravage, then build, then explore. Then you use your slow powers. That may sound like a lot, but it's pretty intuitive and you will get the hang of it after a few rounds. It's a very methodical system. And for those looking for more gameplay variety, there are lots of ways to customize your game. I already discussed the blight cards, but there are also adversaries and scenarios. Adversaries give you a specific country you are facing against, each with a different methodology for their colonization. For example, England is very stubborn about building its cities, and seeks to have a solid power base, while Sweden seems interested in assimilating the Dahan into their society. Though to be clear, this is not supposed to be historically accurate. The lore of the game states that this is a different world with an altered history. The effort was put towards depicting different kinds of colonization, not necessarily towards sticking to history. I find the scenarios to be very fun though, where spirits change how you play, Adversaries change how your opposition behaves. Scenarios change some of the basic rules of the game. It hands you a different set of goals to accomplish. Maybe you need to perform certain actions to increase terror levels, or try to have the Dahan outnumber the invaders on the entire island. These scenarios take the same gameplay and tweak it to make it a significantly different game. For example, I love the Dahan insurrection scenario since it feels like an act of war between the natives and imperialists, instead of the rising tensions inherent in one group slowly invading another's home. And all that is only the core game. Spirit Island has a few expansions that fill out the content even more. More spirits, more adversaries, more scenarios, more blight cards, more power cards, more fear cards. What's more, Branch and Claw, the first major expansion, added new tokens and event cards. Event cards are drawn right before the invader phase, and add a bit of randomness to the game, allowing invaders to do more things, but also give the spirits some minor boosts. As for the tokens, you have the animal tokens, which are usually inert until powers and events make them do stuff, wilds, which prevent one explorer in that land, diseases, which prevents one build in that land, and strife, which prevents one invader from dealing damage in their next ravage. And as of the release of this video, Branch and Claw will be made available on digital tomorrow. And no, I did not plan this. I just have really good timing. 
As for Jagged Earth, on top of tossing you a ton more spirits, adversaries, and scenarios to play with, it also provides the Badlands token, which increases damage dealt in a certain land. There might be more, but I personally don't have any first-hand experience of playing Jagged Earth. And they are not done. No, they are planning on doing even more in the future, and I will certainly keep an eye on how things are going. Before I go, since I don't trust my skill level enough to get gameplay advice, if you want to see more direct assistance videos, I suggest the Spirit Spotlights on the Greater Than Games YouTube, Peasants Game Utopia's Beginner Guides, and the Weekly Spirit Island Saturday's Twitch stream on Handelabra with Lou Dolphin. And that is Spirit Island, another amazing game to try out. I hope you have enjoyed this overview. If I missed anything, and I'm pretty sure I did, feel free to tell me. As of now, take care friends. But it's still just... <laughs> Wait, what? I skipped something. Whoops. And the other invader cards move a space to the left. It's left, not right, left. Bloop, bloop. Bloop, bloop. <laughs> oh, shit. I did not actually finish this thought. I'm dumb.